Hello, welcome to today's webcast focused on the capabilities of the New York Creates and AIM Photonics Test Assembly and Packaging Facility, or TAP as everyone calls it. Thank you for joining us. This is Pete Singer, editor of Semiconductor Digest and today's moderator. We have two great presenters today. Uh, we'll hear from Mike Cumbo, who is the CEO of AIM Photonics, and he'll give us a big picture overview. And he'll be followed by Ed White, who's Associate Vice President for the TAP facility and he's going to give us some some detailed information and including some examples of recent success stories and lessons learned. Following the presentations, we'll have a question and answer session, so stay tuned for that. You can ask a question at any time during the presentation or during the Q&A session via the web using your chat function. We'll uh, see those here in the broadcast booth and, and read those verbally. So with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Mike Kumbo. Thank you, Pete. I trust that everybody can hear me. Um, happy to be uh, starting off this webinar on behalf of AIM Photonics and our test assembly and packaging facility. Um, I'm going to say a few words about the umbrella organization uh, over which uh, or under which AIM Photonics, including its Albany and Rochester sites, exist. This is called New York Creates. Go. So some of you know what New York Creates is, but in case you don't, there's the acronym uh, where it comes from, New York Center for Research, Economic Advancement, Technology, Engineering and Science Corporation. It's a nonprofit um, R&D and innovation hub. Uh, we specialize in uh, semiconductor and related technologies and uh, integrated photonics is a big part of what we do. We have uh, a large facility in Albany, um, 150,000 square feet of clean room space, uh, 2,700 staff people, talented people, and an operating budget uh, north of $300 million. That's just a picture of the uh, the campus in, in Albany, New York, near the New York State Thruway. Okay, the uh, New, York, uh, New York Creates as an entity involves many sites besides the uh, Albany, uh, the Albany Fab where we do our silicon photonics work. Um, the, uh, the Rochester facility is to the west on this map by about uh, 230 miles or so, about four hours on the New York State Thruway. So you can see in the blue box there with the uh, the other gold star, the Rochester AIM Photonics TAP facility. And there are other facilities that are involved with uh, non-photonics related work, things on behalf of the pharmaceutical industry, as well as uh, electric vehicles, and notably Tesla and other things. Um, the big picture for New York Creates is uh, uh, portrayed on this slide. Our key stakeholders are across the top, um, including industry, the State University of New York's Research Foundation, New York State itself, the Empire State Development Corporation, and the uh, U.S. government, most notably the Department of Defense. So as I stated earlier, New York Creates is a 501c3 nonprofit agency uh, and really is involved with uh, three different um, important vectors, workforce development, economic uh, development, commercialization, meaning jobs, and then our fundamental work in uh, technology research and development. This is a, a timeline. Uh, New York Creates uh, came into being as a, a legal entity recently, uh, but the, the work at the, uh, um, the Albany site in particular, which is adjacent to the SUNY, SUNY Poly campus, uh, goes back to uh, 1998 time frame. You can see a number of very large blue chip uh, corporations have been involved in sponsoring research and development activities with us. AIM Photonics came into being in uh, July of 2015, and we continue to build momentum with a number of uh, small, medium, and large corporations uh, in partnership with us. The strategic research thrusts of New York Creates, uh, these things that exist underneath the New York Creates umbrella are listed here. So you can see the lead program in integrated photonics is what is known as AIM Photonics. AIM is a uh, Department of Defense National Manufacturing Innovation Institute. It's one of 15 such institutes. Uh, and I think it's probably the, the, the largest in terms of um, funding and infrastructure. And you can read some of the other activities that New York Creates is involved with uh, advanced electronics, neuromorphic computing, quantum technologies of various kinds, wide band gap, uh, power electronics, and uh, nanobio devices. Uh, this is a, 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 
a top uh, higher altitude picture of the uh, the Albany campus. The uh, the green boxes that are overlaid on the picture are an indication of where the actual clean rooms are. So there are actually four large interconnected clean rooms that are used for various uh, research development and, and pilot manufacturing activities. As I said, in all, there's about 150,000 square feet of clean room space. The uh, the fab itself is uh, uh, a, a very unique R and D capability. 300 millimeter diameter uh, silicon wafers are uh, processed in the fab. Lots of state of the art um, equipment and process technology is available to um, the folks who work there. Uh, you can see some examples on the on the bottom uh, left and center of the types of innovative uh, semiconductor or semiconductor like structures that are uh, that are produced in the fab. Um, our main interest uh, as one of uh, several important users of that fab is in integrated photonics. And so we focus on applications like communications, and that means both uh, data center as well as long haul uh, communications, chip to chip, uh, board to board, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, sensing of various kinds, LIDAR, uh, uh, PNT. Uh, and ultra-sensitive detectors were used in industry, basic science, uh, sec national security, medical diagnostics, et cetera, and then all kinds of uh, advanced advanced computing and big data-related structures. The, uh, the, the facility uh, known as TAP is in Rochester, New York. Uh, I have a picture there that I think Ed, Ed White will probably elaborate on, so I won't dwell on it. And at this point, I will turn over the microphone to Ed. Very good. Uh, hello, my name is Ed White, as Mike uh, said. I have responsibility for the AIM Photonics Test Assembly and Packaging Facility, also known as TAP. Uh, thank you for attending uh, this webinar today. This is our first of several webinars to come. Um, we're planning to do a periodic webinars to keep you informed of uh, new and developing capabilities at TAP. Uh, the good news um, at TAP is our capabilities are expanding and we're uh, providing uh, needed services uh, to, uh, uh, to our customers. Um, although TAP has been up and running for a while now, uh, there are always uh, attendees in these forums uh, who are learning about TAP for the first time. So uh, given that, I thought it might be good to break this uh, webinar uh, into uh, a few parts. Um, for those people who are less familiar with TAP, I'll give you a brief tour of TAP, uh, focusing really on the tool set and some of the capabilities uh, that we have. Uh, since we've been doing uh, customer work for a while now, um, we've developed process flows for various uh, customers. And I thought it would be good to walk through an example of uh, a customer process flow and then talk a bit about um, uh, design capabilities. You know, finally, I, um, I'll share information that we're frequently asked um, as customers engage us. And uh, this um, information is associated with the work that we've done and are doing um, for current customers. Of course, you know, uh, I think everyone knows that I'm not at liberty to share specific details of our customer work. Um, but uh, this section is intended to convey the learnings that might help you um, uh, have a, a successful packaging uh, or engagement with uh, with TAP. Uh, so first up, um, we'll talk a bit about. Um, hold on a second. We'll talk a bit about um, the details um, associated um, with uh, with TAP. Um, so the mission of TAP um, is to develop uh, advanced manufacturing processes for photonic and microelectronic test assembly and packaging. Um, you know, we, we, we tell folks that we have uh, capability on wafer, in wafer scale as well as uh, chip scale, uh, meaning that we can work at the wafer level and the chip level, and we're happy to take uh, either uh, from you. Uh, we also um, uh, have uh, the ability to um, uh, work with uh, various size wafers. We're predominantly a 300 millimeter wafer facility, um, but um, in some cases, some of our processes are also flexible enough uh, to um, be able to handle 200 millimeter, and in some cases, 150. Um, we're a open access um, facility, 
Um, and open access is uh, can be a bit misleading, so it might make sense to spend a few minutes uh, just or a few seconds just talking about open access. Open access means that we're not tied or wed to one corporation. Um, we invite all users to, uh, to participate with us. Um, we also are not like a university where you might um, you know rent time in the facility. Um, for us, uh, we uh, you, and you'll learn a little bit later in the in the uh, program um, about our engagement process. But we develop a statement of work, um, and we operate the tools for the customer. So um, we are running the tools, uh, and uh, that um, uh, helps uh, be certain that we get the best possible outcome um, out of the the tool set. We have a state of art, um, a state of the art uh, tool set. Um, every tool that we have in this facility was purchased new, and um, as a result, um, we uh, uh, have just a, a, a great tool set that's available to do uh, work for our, our customers. Um, our uh, we do product and process development, um, and uh, that means um, if you're going to uh, do a higher volume amount of work and you want to move that to a OSAT, um, we can help you develop the process that that OSAT can run for you. And if you're working on product development, we can help you develop uh, your product in terms of providing you prototypes and samples. Um, although we're not export controlled um, uh, uh, capable today, um, we, we do have a plan to become uh, export control um, uh, uh, compliant, and particularly um, ITAR. And as I mentioned before, we um, uh, our specialty is helping folks uh, get to production. So developing the processes that uh, we're up to production. And as I'll talk a little bit later um, in this presentation, um, we do have uh, flexible process flows. Okay. Um, some folks have asked, you know, uh, has TAP um, operated during COVID? Um, we have continued to operate uh, during COVID. We um, are uh, designated as an essential um, uh, uh, business. And, um, and so that's allowed us to operate with some limitations. So we do have uh, restrictions uh, that uh, continue to be in place. Visitors and contractors continue to be limited uh, to critical to operations. Um, and social distancing and masks are always required. Uh, we also um, uh, have been able to do process development work as well as our standing, standard operating procedure development work um, throughout the year. And uh, customer work has continued. Um, vendors and contractors have been on site to finish up a few punch list um, items uh, during uh, this uh, time. For those of you who have uh, known about TAP for a while, you may be familiar with this slide, um, but this is a indication or a description of um, our facility um, from a graphical and image standpoint. We're on, uh, we're in about 30,000 square feet. We're on two floors um, and you're able to see the uh, uh, clean rooms. We have three large clean rooms. We have a smaller metrology area. We have a sub fab. And to the right of this um, slide, you can see actually the pictures um, inside of uh, the clean room and the metrology uh, facility. Just a little more details on the specific clean rooms. This is our optical and failure analysis lab. And you can see that it's uh, you know, quite well equipped. I won't go through each one of the pieces of equipment here, um, but um, uh, safe, uh, suffice to say that um, almost any kind of metrology that you want to do relative to semiconductor devices, um, we have uh, available um, in the in this facility. Um, we we also um, have um, a uh, fully capable um, uh, prober, um, and when that prober is uh, fully operational. Um, you will be able to pro probe both uh, wafers as well as uh, coupons or uh, component die pieces. In our fourth floor um, uh, west uh, clean room, um, this is our what we call our packaging clean room. And a couple things I would call your attention to on this slide. One is um, for sure the equipment. You know, this is where our flip chip bonder is, our SMT line. 
um, our wire bonders, our shear pull testers. Um, we will have a wafer marker uh, coming in, but we do have available space um, on this floor. And as we engage customers, customers that want to do long-term work with us, we have space available for those uh, customers to actually occupy space in the clean room and work alongside of us. On the fifth floor, um, we have um, a fifth floor east, I should say, we have our um, metals area and our lithography area. On the far left is our uh, Canon um, lithography tool, um, as well as um, uh, photo resist uh, capabilities in dry film attach and uh, coat track. And then working left to right, you can see that we have both electrolytic plater and the electrolyst plater. Um, we also have a plasma tool and a PVD sputterer. Um, this suite of tools allows us to do uh, um, you know, uh, substantial metallization. And we'll also talk a little bit later about um, our bumping capability, which um, we're bringing online uh, right now. Our fifth floor west clean room um, is probably our most full clean room. Um, and um, you know we, we start with uh, dicing um, on the uh, left side of this screen. So we're able to do mechanical dicing, plasma dicing, laser dicing. We're also able to do, um, uh, you know, we have our uh, wafer dicing tape frame there. Uh, we have wire bonding capability on this floor as well. Um, we have fiber prep, and then um, we have our fiber attach tool. This is a Ficon Tech uh, fiber attach tool on the uh, fifth floor west uh, clean room. So just a moment about um, a cap, uh, a tap capabilities. So this is a you know, 30,000 foot view of our capabilities. And one of the things I would encourage you to think about is not think about this slide as just the capabilities that exist um, at TAP, but think about it in terms of you know, spurring questions in can you do this, can you do that? You know, these, uh, this slide is kind of a thought provoker. Um, because we're always interested in expanding our capabilities and working with you specifically on your product. But starting from the left and working our way through this, um, again, I won't go through every single line item, but um, I do want to call your attention to a few things. Probably our most active tool um, in the facility is our fiber attach tool. Uh, we're able to attach single mode fibers as well as we're able to attach you know, fiber arrays, polarization maintaining uh, fiber arrays, um, all of our uh, attach is active alignment. And as we get towards the end of this presentation, this webinar today, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that active alignment. We're able to do flip chip. Um, that's uh, thermal um, you know, soldering with uh, sonic or compression uh, added. And this tool has um, you know, very good uh, placement accuracy. So placement within a half of a micron um, uh, tolerance. Uh, we were able to probe, uh, optical probing, RF, and DC. Um, and we're able to dice, and I've talked about that a bit when we were looking at the clean rooms. So we're able to dice uh, standard wafers, standard thickness wafers, 775 microns is a typical 300 millimeter uh, wafer thickness. But we're also able to uh, dice uh, thin uh, wafers. Um, and um, you know that's with either our plasma uh, dicer or our laser dicer. Um, typical dicing streets for mechanical dicing are you know, greater than 100 microns for the street. And um, for our plasma and laser dicer, we can get very, very small streets, uh, 10 to 15 uh, microns. Um, die attach, you know, we, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a little bit as well. Um, but we have conductive and non-conductive adhesives that um, we use to uh, attach die. Um, our wire bonding capability, um, we uh, do most of our wire bonding with gold wire um, and um, our wire bonding uh, pads um, typically are in the uh, 70, 60 to 75 uh, micron square uh, pads and um, we attach one to two mil uh, gold wire. Um, plating, uh, quite a bit of capability on plating. Um, and again, I won't read all of the materials, all the metals that we can plate, um, but um, if you don't see a metal that you're interested in here, 
um, particularly um, from a sputtering standpoint. And there's a significant amount of work that you have for us to do. Um, we might be able to uh, uh, kind of refit our sputtering tool, our PVD sputtering tool, with um, uh, you know a different target um, so that we can sputter your metal of choice. Um, bumping, um, you'll you hear a little bit more about bumping in just a bit, and um, and then um, metrology um, also we have in the optical and um, uh, metrology lab. Uh, microscopy, spectroscopy, uh, profilometry, we have x-ray technology, acoustic technology, um, and we have uh, quite a bit of um, um, you know, transmission bird testing um, available. Just a few more comments about um, testing I'd like to share with you. Um, from, a, from a testing standpoint, um, I'm just trying to move here a there we go. Um, we have, uh, you know, capability as I mentioned before, wafer, dye, and gel, um, probe, uh, gel pack probing, um, and we also have an optical table that's well equipped with a video microscope for probing, but also three-axis stages for fiber and DUT, um, and then um, three-axis rotational stage for development as well. And then our test equipment is. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, more numerous than um, I can go through here, uh, but suffice to say we have a variety of laser sources um, that we can deploy, photo detectors, amplifiers, modulators, analyzers, and um, uh, data, um, uh, data rate uh, testing uh, equipment. So we have, you know, significant amount of capability in our, our testing uh, area as well. I wanted to spend a moment, now that I've described the capabilities that we have available, I wanted to spend a moment and kind of walk through an example of a process flow. This might be a bit of an eye test uh, for you. I, I know that the font size is, um, is a bit small. But uh, this is an example, uh, and it's only an example, it's not a specific customer um, that um, I'm referring to here. But uh, it's an example of the type of process flows that we have available um, you know so wafer from uh, and i also i want to call your attention that we can take wafers from any fab we have a, a very good partnership with our sister organization in albany the fab there and so we um, obviously will take wafers and dyes from that fab um, but we will take you know um, a wafer or dye from any fab that you've um, uh, had your product fab that um, we also um, will take um, uh, individual dye or coupons, and we can do a number of processes on individual dye. This is particularly useful if you've run a MPW run with us um, at, um, uh, at the Albany facility. This process, these, these processes are flexible in, in such that you can enter the process at any point, and you can exit a process at any point. So for example, if you wanted uh, metallization done on a wafer and that's all you want it done, we can do that. If you wanted to go through the dicing process and then just get diced dye back, um, we can accommodate you there as well. And we can also go through the entire process to take your wafer at the very beginning or your dye at the very beginning and return to you a fully packaged uh, dye with uh, IO attached. Um, we, we also have uh, on-site offices and I don't know that I called your attention to that when we were looking at the, um, the layout of the facility, but we do have offices available here that when we're doing your work, if you wanna come and spend time with us, sit with us and then uh, spend time in the clean room and um, watch the, uh, uh, the processes being done to your die, uh, to your devices, we're uh, happy to accommodate you there. Um, and uh, lastly, um, uh, on these uh, uh, comments here, um, I, would, I mentioned that we have clean room space available um, that um, um, we would love to have you uh, come and join us if you have a project that you're bringing to market or you have a technology you're developing. So if we look to the right here and we look at the examples of the process flows, um, you know, we, you, we take on wafers, um, we can do pick bumping, we can do bumping on uh, picks, we can do bumping on interposers. 
And we're just now completing the first stage of the development for bumping. Um, we have an uh, active customer right now that we're uh, bumping for, um, and we'll be adding capability to do bumping um, on, on wafers that do have topography on them. That's a little bit more challenging. Um, we have uh, wafer and, and coupon dicing, so it could go from um, you know, a bumping process to a dicing process. Um, and then once it's been singulated, it could go to a flip chip. Um, and then we can mount the die for you either on a, a individual package like a leadless chip carrier or on a circuit board. Um, clearly, we can fabricate those mounts in advance. We can attach to a, a, a laminate, a ball grid array or a printed wire board. And, um, and then we can um, wire bond as well. Um, so uh, we're seeing a number of customers that um, are interested in wire bonding, uh, either uh, from die to die or die to board, and um, we're uh, set up to accommodate that. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, we're, uh, you know, uh, we can do fiber attach. Um, and that's fiber attach in single fibers or in fiber uh, arrays. I wanted to walk through a uh, example of a customer job, and I'm not disclosing any information about um, this particular customer or the, the nature of the job. And I'll just say that if you look closely at the die, you'll see grayed out areas that uh, doesn't allow you to actually see the die design because um, that's confidential to, uh, to our customers and we never disclose uh, customer information. So, you know, in this case, TAP received a section of wafer um, and uh, we diced that wafer into um, individual dye. We pick and place that dye into gel packs. Um, and then we attached um, a leadless chip carrier uh, LCC and that's in the upper right hand corner there. You'll see um, what I refer to as a leadless chip carrier. We attached that to a PC board. Um, we mounted a shim inside that leadless uh, uh, chip carrier uh, package so that the die could be mounted on top of that shim and it would align with the edge and we could use the edge of that chip carrier for our strain relief. Um, we attached the, uh, the pick on the shim. We wire bonded from the die uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the chip carrier. One important thing to say about um, um, you know, picks and interposers if you have pads on your picks and interposers, um, you can probe those for sure, um, but um, you end up having a much more robust package if you're probing um, pads on a board or if you're probing pads on a leadless chip carrier. They'll just last much longer than the pads on um, a pick or an interposer. And that's not a statement about our fab in Albany, it's a statement about anybody's fab. Um, um, we, uh, as I mentioned, we wire bonded. We ran through a testing of strength of those wire bonds for the customer. Um, and then we prepped um, optical fiber. We actually spliced um, uh, ultra high NA7 uh, to SMF28 um, uh, fiber that we used to then attach to the, um, um, to the pick. And then we, we fabricated a custom shipping fixture for this um, uh, customer and um, that allowed us to uh, ship to the customer without uh, damage. So the images on the right-hand side, you know, they start at the top with the design of the package that we ultimately made. Um, they then went to the leadless chip carrier that I talked about, um, a, uh, just a small uh, indication of our wire bonding there, um, fiber attach, um, and then in the lower left, this is what the package looked like, um, all completed with uh, three connectors on the fiber. Uh, that we attach to the chip, and then our 3D printed um, uh, assembly uh, fixture uh, that we uh, ship back to the customer. So you can see that from this example, it's a pretty full service um, uh, that we can provide. I now want to move to um, looking at um, our design capability. Um, and it's not really our design capability, but it's a service, it's a, it's a option provided to you uh, to get our packaging design guide and use that as you um, develop your, uh, your package that you'd like us to do. Um, I would, I'll just let you know that 
you'll have a more successful engagement um, with TAP the earlier you, you have TAP involved. And particularly in the very early stages as you're designing your die, if you're talking to TAP about packaging at the same time, you ultimately end up in a mode where you're designing for packaging. And that will just help you out um, in, a, in a big way for a successful uh, engagement, a successful package. So we have this design guide. Um, it's uh, 10 chapters plus a, an appendix. Um, it uh, lays out general guidance for, for packaging. Um, it talks about preferred packaging layouts. It talks a bit about our capabilities. Um, it um, is available um, to anybody who gets a um, signs up for a PDK agreement with uh, AIM. And um, um, we might make this available just in general um, for even if you don't sign up with a P for a PDK uh, licensing agreement, um, this may become available to um, uh, uh, just a general uh, packaging, uh, you know, customers that require packaging. Um, the content continues to evolve. This is not a, this is a living document. It's not a stagnant document. So continue to add content um, as uh, time goes on. And I want to give credit where credit is due. You know, this uh, document was um, originated by you know, RIT and University of Rochester, um, uh, Tom Brown, Stephen Preble, um, but also contributed to um, by the folks at Columbia, SUNY Poly, uh, and, uh, and AIM. So it's, it's definitely a, a work of, of many, um, and it will just grow in content um, over time. So if you already have access to our PDK, we can certainly make um, available the access to this um, uh, packaging design guide. Just a couple of comments um, about the design guide. You know, this is the table of contents you're looking at here. Um, the design guide gives an overview of TAP. It gives, um, uh, you know, it talks, discusses optical input and output, fiber attached, layout principles, um, and, and a number of other uh, key areas. I won't walk through them all, but I'll go to the next slide and just give you a flavor for what's inside. So you can see on this one page, uh, fiber arrays being talked about the alignment and constraints and tolerancing, you know, uh, using a leadless uh, chip carrier as your, um, uh, as your package, um, and then also, um, uh, you know, adhesives uh, as, as we do fiber attach. So um, it's, um, it's much bigger than these five pages here, uh, 10 chapters uh, with an appendix. And if, again, if you already have the access to the PDK, um, I would encourage you to make a request and we can send you this as well. Um, moving on to um, technology development, um, and I apologize uh, for, for going uh, you know, really fast. Um, I, I do have a lot to cover in a short time, um, and there will be an opportunity for questions um, at, the, uh, at the end. Um, I mentioned uh, bumping. Um, we have um, uh, and are, we are developing a bumping capability, and uh, we do have a roadmap uh, to improve that capability over time. On the left-hand side are the um, uh, the bumping uh, process steps um, and the tools uh, that uh, that we're that we're using. Um, you, you'll see some red boxes there. These are tools that we're currently um, you know resolving some uh, issues and, and working out development, but we. We do have a capability that we're standing up. And so if you have a bumping need, um, please let us know. We're, we're very interested in accommodating uh, what you're looking for. Um, down on the lower left, you can see some images of the copper pillars um, that we, uh, ten, we uh, plate uh, 10 silver um, on top. And um, over on the left, in the lower left, you can see the copper pillars um, with the uh, 10 silver um, tops. And, and this is prior to reflow. So you end up stacking these two metals um, and then send it through the reflow oven to get um, a uh, hemispherical uh, um, uh, top on the pillar. And we're doing this using kind of a, a bump test structure and that's an image of our test structure. It gives us an opportunity to work on 100 micron uh, pitch uh, bumps and also 50 and, and 25 microns. So the difference in the size of the squares there represent the different um, uh, pinch, uh, bump densities that um, we're working on developing. 
And then in the upper right hand corner, um, the bumping uh, capability roadmap, we're working our way down from 100 micron pitch, which we're doing for a customer right now, um, uh, doing the development um, and uh, doing their bumping uh, right now, uh, to 50 micron pitch and then down to uh, uh, around 30 micron pitch um, is, is our plan. We've, we've looked at you know, our capability and we've, we've certainly got a, a vast um, array of capabilities here at TAP, but there are some things that we know that we need to continue to work on to develop um, uh, additional capability or the capability we have today even more thoroughly. Um, so one of the uh, areas that we've seen as an opportunity is uh, RDL. And we know that as uh, the uh, increase uh, you know, grows or as the uh, density for uh, I.O. grows, there uh, is a requirement for fan in and fan out uh, to be able to enable uh, uh, interconnects. And we, we feel like we need to add this capability uh, at TAP. So we're exploring this um, right now in terms of how we're, how we're going to do that. And um, ultimately, we plan to select and implement a RDL process, which will accommodate the majority of our customers' uh, requirements. We know that we can't be all things to all people, so we'll try to be as much as we can to as many as we can. Um, we do have some limitations around um, environmental health and safety for this facility. So the process that we choose for RDL um, uh, will have to uh, be uh, constrained uh, by, or will be constrained by those uh, restrictions. Um, we'll enable, um, we, we want to pick a process that enables a transition from process development into use in a reasonable amount of time. Um, there's a fair amount of demand um, for, uh, you know, projects with the government, DARPA projects, um, as well as um, for commercial projects to be able to um, densely bump and then to fan out so there can be interconnects um, attached. So we want to be able to service uh, this requirement and so RDL can be an important part of being able to support your needs there. In terms of fiber attach, our continuation of work is um, uh, in, in terms of uh, polarization maintaining uh, single fiber attach. Um, right now, we uh, do attach uh, PM fiber, um, but we typically do that via fiber array. Um, so if it's multiple fibers, we can certainly do it in an array. Or even if it's a single fiber, you can buy purchase an array or a block that has a single fiber in the block that is oriented um, such that we can um, attach it and you can have polarization maintaining onto the, onto the die. Um, you know, fixturing is a big deal for us. Um, it allows for consistent handling die to die or job to job. And um, being able to handle single fibers and arrays um, in, you know, kind of multiple uh, different scenarios um, is, is, is critically important. And one of the things that we always are looking at is, you know, how can we speed up the process such that we can lower the cost to our customers. You know, we do not want to have the customers in a situation where they're limited um, in their the amount of spins they can do with us or the iterate now, number of iterations um, because of costs. So we're always looking to take costs down by reducing the setup time and you know the non-recurring engineering time. And um, you know, fixturing as going back to the previous uh, point um, is, is a key part of this. Um, we're also uh, looking at, um, you know, attaching uh, optical isolators as more and more customers are interested in uh, light sources on dye. Um, you know, customers are also interested in isolating um, those light sources. So we're uh, doing development work uh, right now um, on attaching uh, isolators, passive isolators. And then in the future, we've had at least one customer kind of raise their hand and indicate that they're interested in doing die to die attach. Um, we haven't done this yet. It's I've labeled this future, but it's kind of an interesting uh, concept for sure. Um, laser attach um, uh, and those things that go along with laser attach, so picks and isolators, 
um, that's an area of uh, development for us as well. And in the interest of time, we'll just jump down to the development areas. Uh, you know, six axis optical alignment for lasers, picks and isolators um, is a critical area for us to uh, continue to develop as well as flip chipping for devices that require electrical connection. Um, so the um, uh, soldering of you know, more than one laser on a die or the soldering of a pick and, and a laser or a pick and more, more than one laser um, is, is a challenge as we look at reflow temperatures. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a moment. And then, of course, metallurgy on dye is um, with uh, that dye that has topography, meaning trenches. Um, we're working on more fully developing that um, uh, as well. So, so far, I've covered a bit about the background of, of, of TAP, you know, what, what we have, what the facility looks like, what the capabilities are in general. We've covered a little bit about um, areas of technology development that we're continuing to work on. And now I wanted to just spend a few moments talking about information relative to uh, lessons learned, if you will, from customer experiences. For uh, die mounting, um, you know, a few things that um, uh, may serve you well is that uh, many of our customers come to us and ask for fiber attach. One of the things that I tell them very quickly is that uh, for their benefit, as well as for our benefit, we need to mount that die, whether it be a pick or an interposer, um, in a package. It allows us to handle it better. It allows us to secure the uh, fiber that we're attaching. Um, it's just um, a much more robust package. Um, when we can mount the die. So die mounts can be custom, and we've had uh, uh, you know, uh, customers that are attaching heat sinks um, to um, uh, passive or active heat sinks to a die mount, um, and then the die gets mounted to that um, um, uh, mount um, with the heat sink on the bottom, um, and, and that works really well. Um, and we've had, um, um, situations and in, in most of the situations where we're mounting, where we use uh, shims, ceramic, silicon, metal, or glass shims um, to adjust the height of the die to enable downstream processes. Um, we have a very nice uh, Camelot tool, which does precision uh, adhesive dispense, which allows us to consistently hit die heights um, you know, and, and, and maintain bond lines um, and minimizing squeeze out. Um, around the uh, um, around the die. On the left hand side there you see um, a, 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 a seven and a half millimeter glue line um, and that was used to um, attach the, the, the 10 by five millimeter test die uh, that you see there as well. Um, on the right you see a, a job for a, a customer um, where we've attached a, uh, a pick um, inside a LCC um, leadless chip carrier, and um, I've uh, grayed out the um, the die so you are not able to see the uh, uh, the design of the die, um, and we've attached that um, uh, both the uh, ceramic shim to the leadless chip carrier with conductive adhesive, and then attached the die to the shim with uh, with adhesive as well. Um, and um, just in passing, I mentioned that this uh, shim in this case is a ceramic uh, shim. The ceramic shims um, afford the opportunity for very low uh, movement um, as uh, uh, temperatures change. Uh, fiber attached, some information that might help you as you, um, uh, you come to do work um, with, uh, with TAP. Um, you know, we can attach uh, single fibers, uh, SMF or ultra high NA. Um, we can attach fiber arrays. Um, all single fibers and fiber arrays, as I mentioned earlier, um, are actively aligned. Um, you know, we can do uh, various diameters of fibers. Um, you know, the two that we've worked with so far are 80 micron uh, diameter fiber and 125 uh, micron uh, diameter. Uh, for, there's not a standard 
for fiber array pitch, although there's there's quickly becoming kind of a de facto default standard. Um, and for um, most um, fiber arrays, the pitch is 127 microns or 250 microns. Um, and so if you go to buy a fiber array, those are the most common sizes that the um, fiber array producers are, are, are manufacturing. Of course, you can get any size, any pitch that you want, um, but if you want to shorten the lead time um, from order to uh, delivery, uh, going with something that they're most familiar with will, um, will, will help that. Uh, single fiber attach, um, a pitch, if you're going to do a single fiber attach and multiple single fiber attached on one side of the die, we recommend between 435 or to 500 micron um, spacing between the fibers. And that's because of the grippers having to go in and grip the fiber and then release the fiber and move to the next one. You need a fair amount more space between the fibers um, than you do if you're using a fiber array. Um, and then you also need um, to consider a means uh, to measure the coupled light. So I mentioned that all of our um, attach is active alignment. And, um, and so we uh, launch light into the fiber and then we measure light at, on the die um, or we uh, measure light off of the die if it's a loop back. But there needs to be a means to kind of measure the couple light, either loop backs or detectors or through, or through pass all the way to the other side of the die. Um, and um, loop back configurations for arrays uh, should use fibers that are, are widely spaced. So if you have um, a 12 fiber or an eight channel uh, array, um, it's ideal for us if the loop back goes um, uh, onto the die in channel one and off of the die um, back into uh, on channel eight. Um, and what that would do um, on an eight channel array, it's, it would give us the ability to control the two outlying um, positions, uh, fibers at the two outlying positions, which uh, as you know, in fiber arrays, the middle fibers go for the ride. You, you, you can't manipulate them on a fiber array. So it gives you the opportunity to get the most precise alignment if you can space out um, to the full width of the fiber array. Our standard wavelength for active alignment is 1550. And um, um, just the last comment there, um, fiber arrays, fibers and arrays are attached uh, with index matched uh, UV adhesive. Um, nearing the end here, and I'm you know, conscious of the time um, that we have left. Um, a dicing, um, you know, we have the ability to dice for you um, using a mechanical saw, um, plasma or laser. Our dicing streets are typically um, you know, greater than 100 micron for sawing. Uh, both wafers and coupons can be sawn. So if you're getting something off of our MPW run and you've got two or three or four die on the, um, on the uh, die that you bought on a, a MPW, um, we can dice that in sections. And we also work closely with the team in Albany. They can send us your die directly from the Albany facility. We can dice it so it doesn't necessarily have to go to you and then come back to us. Um, uh, mechanical sawing creates a lip. I'm sure everybody who has um, worked in this arena already is familiar with the lip that um, when you dice down the middle of a 200 or 100 uh, micron dicing street with a 50 micron uh, dicing blade, you create a 25 micron lip on each side. We can accommodate that lip um, when we're doing fiber attach, but we are also doing some um, uh, development work and some exploration on removing that lip uh, with our plasma dicer. So if you have a situation, particularly if it's a custom wafer and you don't want the lip um, on it, we can plasma dice um, that uh, wafer for you and eliminate that uh, lip completely. Um, Laser dicing typically for thin wafers um, and thin dye. Plasma dicing also uh, can go full thickness, 775 microns, it's, if it's a, um, um, a 300 millimeter wafer. Just a caution around dicing um, for stopped cuts. Um, this might be a tap term, stopped cut. But you can see the red lines in this um, uh, reticle here. 
And if you lay out your die so that you've got a cut that stops at another cut that doesn't cut all the way through X and Y, it becomes a bit of an issue for us. We can certainly do it, but it becomes more costly for you because we've got to remove sections, uh, remove uh, die from the dicing tape frame, reposition it to recut um, the other pieces. So to the extent that you can just um, do X and Y cuts with no stop cuts, um, that's going to be a much less costly solution for you. And then the last two points, um, we, um, um, we, our max pick and place um, is our reticle size. I think that's 20, 32 by 26 uh, millimeters. And um, that's limited by our eject head um, on our uh, pick and place tool, our Royce pick and place tool. And then one of the things that we're learning, we learned this from one of our really good customers, um, is the importance of uh, cleanliness um, in dicing, particularly at the facets. And so we're working hard, making certain that um, we, uh, you know, uh, have um, uh, our uh, our coolant <laughs> running, not only to cool the uh, uh, the saw, but also to wash away debris um, on the um, on the dice the surface, so that um, we maintain a, a clean coupling facet. Um, I'm in the interest of time. I'm going to kind of go through these last two areas uh, really quickly. Um, because we've only got uh, eight minutes uh, left here. Uh, wire bonding um, is um, a important um, uh, uh, task that we do for many jobs. And you can see at the bottom here, um, a number of jobs um, that we've done wire bonding for. One to two mil gold wire um, is uh, most frequently used. You know, consider 75 micron pads with 100 micron pitch. Um, that gives us um, a flexibility to, uh, to get in and um, hit and hit the pads and keep in mind the wire size so the wire length excuse me um, your design should not exceed between three and four millimeters to prevent wire distortion and we've seen some cases lately where the wires are quite long um, and they sag and we end up getting shorting so keep that in mind as you design your um, uh, die uh, flip chipping, we're doing uh, mo uh, more and more flip chipping uh, these days. Uh, we've demonstrated 80 micron uh, pitch uh, bumps onto 80 micron pitch lands. Uh, we've done that uh, for a customer as well as 40 micron um, uh, flip chipping. And the uh, last uh, slide here, uh, just some general information. Um, you know, uh, Tap packages, um, uh, you know, a die that's fabricated at any quality foundry. Um, and I'll just put in a pitch for our Albany foundry. A great foundry, does great job. Um, so we like them a lot. But if you're doing work at another foundry, we can certainly accommodate you. Um, it's an open access facility, not tied to any one entity. So we're happy to do work for government, academia, industry. Um, we engaging TAP early on in the design for packaging leads to better success. And then our typical customer engagement starts with a contact then moves to an NDA. So we protect your work and our processes. Um, it follows into a statement of work. We'll give you a quote. Um, we'll do a contract and then we'll begin work. Um, and so I know I've rushed through this um, a bit and I apologize for the quick go through. There's just a lot to talk about. In future webinars, we'll hone in on a specific topic area and provide much more depth um, and much more detailed numbers uh, that you can use in your design process um, in, um, in our next webinars. So with that, um, uh, Peter, I'll turn it back to you um, and we can do some questions and answers for the limited time that we have left. Okay, thank you, Ed, uh, great job. And thank you, Mike, before you. Uh, so we have indeed entered the Q&A uh, portion of the webcast. And uh, as a reminder, you can ask a question just simply using the uh, questions uh, uh, function tab in, in your browser. So uh, yeah, we've got some really good ones coming in um, that have been coming in. And so let's see, um, I, I think most of these are for you, um, Ed, but uh, Mike, feel free. But uh, here's some um, the First question, are there solutions in, in TAP for RF high frequency wire bonding? So we haven't done a lot of RF wire bonding, but we're very interested in doing it. And so 
Um, I, I guess the, the longer answer would be, um, yes, there are, um, we're willing to do work. We love to talk to the customer um, or the potential customer who submitted that question to understand more detail about what they're looking for. But this is an area that we definitely want to provide support and service to our customers in. So um, I encourage you to contact me um, and, and we can um, have a conversation about what you're looking for. This is something we're very interested in doing. Okay, good, good, perfect. Um, so see, uh, you, you touched on this a little bit, but uh, for fiber attached, does that include both edge and surface um, grading couplers? So most of our work is edge coupling. Um, in, in fact, um, I, I would say all of our work is um, uh, edge coupling, except for we do do um, grading um, detecting. So um, if you have a grading um, uh, on your die and we're using that to determine how well we're coupled, um, you know, so we, so we do do um, work with some grading, but right now we're not attaching to grading couples. Uh, gradings, um, uh, we're only attaching to, uh, to edge right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and similarly, do you see a requirement in the future to be able to do passive fiber attach alignment to a chip? And what would be the requirements in cycle time, um, released minimum tolerances, XYZ angle, et cetera? <laughs> so um, uh, again, that's a much longer question or uh, answer that, than um, we have probably time for. We definitely want to get to passive. Um, you know, active is on the route to passive. We know that um, the uh, place where we need to be for cost um, is, uh, is going to require passive attach. Um, we've got to develop a process for that passive attach. Early on, we licensed some IP um, from a large company, um, domestic company, um, that we hope to deploy um, in that passive attach. Um, but um, clearly, speed is fast. Uh, the speed is faster um, when we're uh, not actively aligning. Um, but we, right now, in the development process, it's only active alignment. Um, in the future, where uh, we want to get the passive. And I guess on my development slide, I should have added that bullet to say that one of the development areas is passive. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. And can you package uh, photonic ICs in standard plastic IC packages, but with uh, um, you know single mode fiber um, a ribbon? So um, mm -hmm. um, we don't use ribbon fiber, um, and, it, and, and it, it's a little bit of a subtlety um, because we do use fiber arrays. Um, but um, ribbon fiber is is different than the fiber arrays. So I'm not 100% sure this is the question that the uh, person's asking, but um, ribbon fiber um, is, is not precisely spaced um, enough for us to use in um, attaching multi-channel fiber to a die. Um, a fiber array, the fiber sits in a V groove often and is precisely located in that v, in in that block to match up with the fiber spacing on the die. So the long answer is that we use fiber arrays as opposed to ribbon fiber right now. the The question about the plastic packaging, I'm I'm, I'm not 100% sure what the question um, is specifically about. So I'm not going to guess. Um, if you have a question, whoever the ask. Whoever asked the question, please contact me, um, and I'd be happy to um, address it in a little bit more depth. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ed. Well, we are close to being out of time, and I, I would suggest we obviously did not uh, get to all the questions, but um, that would be a good solution for those who did not get their questions answered. We we do have your, your name and contact information, and I think Ed, you you can uh, answer those offline in the in the future. I'd be happy to. Okay. All right. Well, with that, let's conclude the webcast. So, uh, thank you very much, Ed and uh, Mike, and uh, very well done. And this presentation will be archived, and we'll uh, send a link to that to those who have registered. So, thank you, and we look forward to future webcasts. So, Peter, if I if I could, 
Um, sure. I, you know, I, I mentioned contacting me, but um, I didn't give my contact uh, information. Go on our website, AIM, um, AIM Photonics website, go to the contact um, page, and you'll see my picture with my email address. And um, if your question didn't get asked or answered, uh, please feel free to contact me. Okay, very good, Ed. Thank you. All right. All right, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Pete. Thank you.